<laughs> Amen. Amen. Welcome. Can you guys, hopefully this is still working. If you guys can tell, I'm using a new mic, which um, I don't personally like, but I think, the, I think the sound guys up there set me up and they messed up my other, <laughs> they, they messed it up, but um, they've been wanting me to use this mic for like ever. Um, now, now they have all the pastors using this. Pastor Kevin wasn't too fond of it either, but I was the last man standing, so it might take some getting used to if you guys can't hear me, people online as well. But welcome, welcome those online and welcome you guys here in the sanctuary. We are, I know I've been telling you guys we've been coming to the end and this is, depending on how far along we get, um, this is the last or second to last before we get into Revelation, so I'm super excited. Um, there's just so much. There's um, personally, there's a lot that I'm praying for as far as what we cover. So continue to pray for me on that. As far as what, how how we're going to handle it, as far as teaching um, teaching it, because what's really cool about the Bible is you can have. The same, well, you can have all the pastors in America or just in general teaching on one specific passage. And the theme is going to be very similar, but what the pastor focuses on is can be different. It can differ. It can be a different message. It's not, they're not all identical. That's the beauty of, 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 of teaching his word. Um, I've heard multiple. Pastors throughout the years, the older ones that have gone through, for example, from Genesis to Revelation and the way that the second time around, it's just, it's so different because their perspective has changed and the way they analyze the scriptures just differently. Um, but it's all about perspective and part of what we're going to be talking about today is, is now that we're wrapping everything up, it, it really truly is about perspective. How we view in light of prophecy and we'll, we'll get into this, there's, there's, there's threefold. But let's pray for the service, pray for the worship team and the rest of the night. Lord, Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you for, again, Father, for your word, for your word endures forever. Heaven and earth will fade away and will die, melt away, literally, Lord. But your word is so precious, Father, that it will endure forever. Lord, it is so important in your eyes, Father, and how much more so should it be important to us, Lord, um, I pray, Father, that you just um, bless this time, anoint this time, open up our eyes and hearts and minds to hear your word and receive your word so that, as Pastor Kevin always says, to be doers of your word as well. Give us that boldness, Father, and that courage to, be, to do that so, but Father. And we just, uh, we thank you. We pray for the service right now. We pray for the worship team, Lord, up here. Father, we pray that you just, um, that you be blessed, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening. You won't you all stand if you can, please.
Take you. 
of ourselves. Lord, may we decrease that you would increase, mm-hmm. Father. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would change each and every one of us. Lord, that when we leave here tonight, we are closer to you than we got here. It's all about you, Lord. We love you. We can't do this life without you. Mm. We can't. And we thank you that you love us. You see us. You know everything about us. You hear us, and yet you choose to love us anyways. Thank you, Father. Oh, praise you, Lord. Father, we pray for Pastor George, that you would be with him, that you would go before him, Father, that you would close his mouth and open up yours, mm-hmm. that your words would come forth, Father. I pray, Lord, that you'd give him strength and you'd give him peace and that you would just fill him with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Why don't you all say hello? Hello. Praise the Lord that I don't have to use that handheld mic. Man, that thing was heavy. So I got to look at it from that perspective. Um, (laughs) I mean, if I'm teaching what I'm going to be teaching today, I I have to apply that. So um, I'll give you guys an update. Last week, um, well, first of all, thank you guys for all your prayers um, for my blood draw, I had it. For those of you who don't know, I have a blood condition where I have too much blood and they have to take it all out. Well, not all of it, but some of it. <laughs> There's blood in the life, as the scripture says, so they can't take out the, too much blood, but they do. They take out um, pretty much a little over this much amount. So it does deplete me. Um, I think it's 18, 19 ounces or something like that. A little bit more than Red Cross usually takes which that's a pint. I'm not sure exactly, but you get the picture. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, it was good. I just didn't have, one of the things that sucks is, is that I don't have that, my cognitive function. It's so difficult for me, uh, this, this fogginess. It just, man, it, it, I was texting Pastor Kevin. He's like, yeah, I had a rough time. Even on Friday, I was, you know, I was like trying to study and I just, I, I was kept messing things up and I couldn't, couldn't get it together. And then finally, you know, yesterday I started studying and putting everything together. Um, cause as some of you guys know, I'm pretty meticulous and I like to go into order. Um, but it is what it is. And the Lord got me through and I'm just super thankful. Um, so, but another update is I talked to you guys about my cousin, who was in Mexico, he passed away, unfortunately, like the very next day. So the day of that I take out my blood, that happens on Monday. And um, it was tough for my mom. It really was because she wanted to see him. And it's just been so difficult to head over there. One, because of finances and many other reasons as well. Um, I don't like to send my mom alone, you know, to to Mexico, especially the parts where they go. Um, But... Anyways, so that, that happened, and then, of course, another passing, which it was her, well, my grandma's mom, well, no, sorry, my grandma's sister, so it was her, my, my mom's aunt, who she was really close to. We're not really close to a lot of family over there, but, of course, that one <laughs> that passed away, she was, and it was a difficult thing, kind of back-to-back, I think the very next day, or a couple of days after, she passed away. Um, so that was like the, the, one of the closest connections to her mom. So she's doing better now. So, but continue to pray for her. Um, um, it was just a difficult time, but praise the Lord. I mean, I was able to minister to her and, and pray with her and, and pray for her cousin before he passed away. Like I told you guys last week, when stuff like that happens, I see God's grace and mercy when they're on their deathbed. 
because there's so many opportunities, even when they fall into comas. I mean, it just, I, I see it. I see it as God's grace and mercy. I truly do. So I just wanted to give you guys an update on that. And um, all my stuff with my hip is moving along. I got the MRIs getting and going. So it'll be hopefully be done soon. Um, and next week, next week though, we'll do another um, injections, um, trigger point injections when they go on the surface, but multiple ones around. But that really helped last time. So thankfully, I'm able to sleep. So that's the, that's the good thing. But, um, but yeah, so we are going to get into the study. But before, I, I want to update you guys in a sense of what's going on. As of one o'clock, one of the new articles, um, we need to continue to pray for Israel. There's a lot of stuff going on over there. One of the things that pertains to prophecy is the president from Turkey, um, Tayyip Erdogan, said this, and I quote him. He says, we must be very strong so that Israel can't do these ridiculous things to Palestine. Just like we entered Karbak, just like we entered Libya, we might do similar to them. Erdogan told the meeting of his ruling in the AK party in his hometown of Rise. Why is that, why is that important? What does it, what does it matter? If you've been here throughout this whole time studying, we understand that in Ezekiel 38, one of the, one of the nations that are going to rise up against is Turkey, right? So it's, we, we got to keep our eyes on it. And I did, you know, it doesn't surprise me because scripture tells us that this is going to occur. So we shouldn't be surprised. The reason why we study and God shows us these things ahead of time is so that we don't, we don't waver on these things. We don't go to and fro from all these silly, silliness and chaos and, 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 and become anxious, right? We're not supposed to be anxious. Um, and I, I firmly believe that when we are anxious and we go through anxiety, I, I think it can, be, it can become sin. It truly can because we're not truly dependent on God's promises, truth, and we don't, we're not trusting in him, right? So, and I've been through that. I know, I'm speaking from experience. I've done that. I've gone through that. And that's the reality of it. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to pray for them. So, so far, we've examined how, we've examined who, the what, when, and where, which is pretty much was all balled into one thing. So um, now we're going to answer the why of Bible prophecy. And this is probably going to be the shortest part as opposed to every single, everything else. But more specifically, why does, why does God give us prophecies of the end times? And I kind of emphasized that previously, is that because so that we do not waver, that we do know that we have a hope, right? The hope of his coming, the hope of, his, of the second advent, him coming um, for us first at the rapture, and then we, you know, we come with him after for the millennial reign. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we ask you, Lord, I ask you, Lord, that, Lord, that may you put my words to the wayside, Father, and your word go forth and pierce through heart, bone, and marrow. Father, speak to me, speak to us here in the sanctuary and those of us online or even in the future that are gonna be listening to this, Lord. I pray, Father, that as my sister spoke, that it, we just be transformed that we grow more and more in the knowledge of your grace and mercy and just know more about you, Father, not for the sake of knowing, but for the sake of relationship and continuing in that relationship, Lord. I pray, Father, that we, we retain as much as you want us to retain, Father. Lord, and I'm just so thankful that I get to share your word and so thankful that we're in this uh, sanctuary here and the privilege of being able to be here. Father, safely and, and, and sound. Lord, we just thank you for that. And I pray that you just bring to remembrance just my studies, Lord, that you've, and, and, and teach, Father, what you want to teach your church, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, so why, does, why does God give us prophecies of the end times? I, I think it's threefold. Now, I don't know if we'll fully cover all three of them, but you can write this down. Number one is to motivate us to live expectantly. Motivate us to live expectantly, which is the doctrine of eminency, which is the doctrine of meaning that the Lord can come at any given time. And throughout scripture, it's easily um, said and interpreted. Second, 
is to motivate us to live righteously, to live righteously. Number three, to motivate us to live with an eternal perspective. Now, if you notice all these things that we're going to be going through them, it's what it is, is it, they, they all kind of mold together. They truly do. Um, but with slight variances, and we're going to see that. So, again, we've spoken about the rapture and how the rapture is imminent. Again, meaning that it can happen, it can occur at any given moment. It can occur during this moment. It can occur during the, at the end or at night or whenever. It could be two months from now or two seconds from now. Um, it's ready to take place. It's impending. Right? So the Apostle Paul tells us that time is running out. And our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. And that's true for every single one of us in here. And the church in general. Because the rapture is, can happen at any given moment. So in Romans 13, 11 through 14, it says, And do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry, and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill, his, fulfill its lust. See, here's the thing. Um, you know, with, with, it, with it happening and being a, a, a point of, of the, the Lord being able to come at any given moment, I mean, we must truly not give any provision. And that word provision, what it means is not to give a foothold, right? And I'm sure Pastor Kevin has spoken about that multiple times, giving the enemy a foothold, giving the enemy the arm, you know? Um, and, And we do that constantly over and over again. And we will put ourselves in positions where we probably shouldn't even be. And the reality is, is that we have, we got ourselves in that place to begin with. You know, um, everything, everything that we do, we, I, I truly believe, and I constantly say this, that a huge percentage of, of the things and, and the discipline that we have to go through is because we put it on ourselves. But here's the most beautiful thing about it. Think about this. With, did Esau ever get punished? He didn't. Did Esau ever get disciplined? He didn't. Did Jacob get, did he get disciplined? Absolutely. There was a difference. We can't see discipline as a form of, oh man, you know, God doesn't love, I, I, I know, look, I, you guys know that I had, I didn't have a good relation with my father, but there was times where I deserved to be disciplined, <laughs> okay? I know that, and I knew that as a kid. You know, kids need discipline. They know that I, they're smarter than you think, okay? I've, I've, I've had my share of youth ministry and dealing with kids. They know what they're doing is wrong. I mean, but it's innate. It's, it's in there. It's like, did you steal that cookie? Mm-mm. Nope, I didn't eat it. Oh, you chocolate all over their face, right? It's like, it's not. <laughs> and they'll still tell you, no. It's like, come on. They know, they know. But my point is this, is that just, this is, we can't make that provision for the, for the enemy to have that ability. We need to separate ourselves. That's why, you know, uh, some people, pers- like they would think, man, you're, you're a boring dude. Like, what, you just go, church, you do this, you do that. I don't, well, you know what? I don't want to put myself in a position to, to do that. As a matter of fact, why? Why do I want to put myself in those positions? Why do I want to go to this party full of, listen, I'm not saying don't minister to sinners, but why would I put myself in a position? And I did this as a young Christian. I truly did. I remember, I wasn't going to share this, but it it, it applies. I remember when I first got saved, I went to a a family party. This is disgusting what I'm about to tell you, so, but, but (laughs) in my opinion, but just, I was there 
and everybody's drinking. I mean, at, there was that point where they literally grabbed me and they tried to force alcohol down my mouth to the point where it just, I, I closed my mouth. They couldn't open my mouth. That's how, that, that's how my family is like, oh, you're not going to drink. They feel convicted. That's the reality. And to the point where, again, this, <laughs> it, was just, it was just ridiculous. Um, it, it just, it's terrible. And I put myself in that position. But if I was weak, if I was weak at that moment, I would have easily done it. It's like, okay, whatever. And then there was other stuff that I won't discuss that they did. But it's, it's some pretty gnarly things. The enemy will go to, um, to the extent. It's ridiculous. But anyways, we will be with Christ following the moment of death, right? So what if we die before the rapture? No problem. We'll put, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The moment of death, we will directly go into the presence of God, right? So the scriptural backdrop, just to understand this whole thing, because um, I, I recently had a question it was from a young, young adult. Um, and they asked me, I was like, hey, what's the difference between soul and spirit? Like, what, they're like, what is the difference? Like, because I asked my dad and they didn't know how to answer it. And well, it, it's, it's actually much deeper if you really think about it. Um, and I'm gonna go through that because I think it's important because it pertains to our personal eschatology. Personally, where are we gonna head? Where's our spirit going to go? Where's our soul going to go? And we're going to see that at times it's interchangeable, but at times it's very similar depending on the context. Let's, let's look at it. So first, before I move on, we want to talk about the material. The material is what we can touch, taste, feel, all these things. Um, it's actually a worldview as well with the atheistic community. They have a materialistic, if it doesn't, you know, all these other things that are immaterial, like even emotions in the mind, they can't comprehend. They can't, they can't put their finger on it, right? But the material human body is in Genesis 2, 7. It says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed. This is... He gathered all the things that needed to happen, but one thing that needed to occur, and without it, there is no life, and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. So the immaterial part is the soul and or spirit, okay? The word soul and spirit can be interchangeable in, in scripture. Now, if we differ on this, I, I'm not gonna sit here and argue with you, um, because there's a difference, and I know there's a lot of debate between what that actually means. But one of the things that we have to do is define those words. Because again, in the context, it's different. It's different. Human beings have a spirit, but we are not spirits. Does it make sense? However, in scripture, only believers are said to be spiritually alive, right? So Colossians 2.13, it says that you being dead in your trespasses the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together. In other words, you were dead before this with him having forgiven you all trespasses. So you have been made spiritually alive when you were forgiven and born again, as John chapter three speaks about with Nicodemus, right? We all know the story that when he comes to, to Jesus at night, he's like, how, must, how, how can I inherit, inherit eternal life? Well, you must be born again, right? And that's the gist of it, to be born from above. That's what the, the, the Greek says. So let's take a look at scripture and how it refers to soul and spirit. First Peter 2, 11 through 12. It says, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain again from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, why? So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. And that just means they can say whatever they want, but if it, but if it isn't true, it isn't true. They got nothing to stand on. That's the reality. You don't, you don't want people or the Gentiles in this, in this, in this manner, which they're speaking to, um, to believers, Gentiles is referred to the non-believers in this situation, but it's like you don't want the non-believer to have anything on you. That's part of being blameless. It's like, oh, well, yeah, that pastor, he gets up Sunday, but Monday morning he's at the bar 
pounding beers. Like, <laughs> no, you can't do that. And I, I, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you um, that alcohol and the whole scenario, I'm not, you would never catch me doing that. Um, but I just, that's, that's just me. Um, but the question is, one of the questions that we have to look at this is the first question is, who is Peter speaking to? Who's he speaking to? Because context, you have to understand who he's speaking to first. So the believer, it's the believer that he's speaking to in this scenario. It's not the non-believer. So he's saying, abstain from freshly lust, which war against the soul. So this right here is referring to the soul as our, as our own self, our psyche, our flesh, our well-being. For example, blessed is the poor in spirit. It's the same word, but that in that Matthew chapter five, verse three, the, the Beatitudes, blessed is the poor in spirit. That's the word pneuma, but it's referring to the Holy Spirit. You, you with me so far? But in this section, when it's referring to soul, again, it's, it's the Greek word psyche, which is where we get the, uh, where we get the word from, uh, from the Greek here, psychology, which is the study of the mind. And it entails the soul and all these things, that the immaterial, for example. So this scenario, it's referring to ourself. It's referring to our mind. It's referring to our soul. It's referring to ourself. So let's look at another scenario where it's talking about the spirit. So James 2.26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And again, who is James speaking to? He's speaking, again, yes, the believer. And in this scenario, like I was telling you, this is referring to what? This is referring to the pneuma. This is referring to the spirit of God. So when we talk about the believer, when this is referring to the soul slash spirit, it can have a dual meaning. So it's not one or the other. It depends on the context of the scripture. So why? this is why definitions are important. I'll give you a story about evangelizing and having a conversation about, for example, critical race theory. Um, critical race theory, um, we, we have to define that critical race theory before we have a conversation about things, about that scenario, because that definition of it is totally different. We have to um, appeal so many things back before we answer that question. Many things, so when we have when we're speaking to people, even within the Christian community, we have to be able to define these things because it's different. And too many times throughout um, just doing ministry, a lot of the times arguments and argumentation, all these things, it really is all a, a lack of communication and effective communication, which I think is important. Communication is important for God too because he communicated to us from the beginning, right? He was with us in the garden, not with us, but human mankind, right? Communication is important. So let's look at one more scenario when Jesus gave up his spirit to God. So Luke 23, 46, it says, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Now, in this scenario, it's the same Greek word. Greek is so complex. You have to understand the context. The way you study Greek is, and, and I, listen, there's, there's so much depth when we, when we study. You don't have to know Greek in order to study it. There's so many resources and tools for us to understand it. You, I, I, don't, I, I often go back to the professionals, to the scholars, to get understanding of scripture, to get understanding. So I commit my spirit, again, same word, having said he breathed his last. But here in this scenario, it's his actual spirit that's leaving him, his soul, right? Because let me ask you this. Do non-believers have souls? Yes, they do. Because we know that in, Rev in Revelation, in the white throne judgment that we talked about yet last week, well, where are these people? They're dead, but yet they're being judged. You see how you have to have definitions? There's, a, there's an importance to it. So there is, there is a difference between these things. So Jesus right here knew that his physical body, it was about to die. 
That's why we can know that as we've talked about, that he is the first resurrection. He is the first Adam. That's why he's referred to that because he was the only one that was ever resurrected. It wasn't any of the other people. Other people were resuscitated. There's a difference. This, Jesus was, what they, when, when everybody else in the Bible, they came back, they came back in their, in their flesh, in their body. They ended up dying again. Jesus will never die again. He's in his glorified body, right? Which we will have at one point as well. When we get caught up, first the old, old uh, the, our, our brethren, and then us. So I don't want to belabor this point, but pneumatology, it's an awesome study. It really is. Pneumatology is just a part of systematic theology, and it's, the stu- it's a fancy word for study of the Holy Spirit. It's really, really awesome. Um, one, of the, one, of, one of the best books that you want to get a whole different perspective on many different scholars and authors, you can read uh, James G. Dunn, and it's um, The Origins of the Holy Spirit. So The Holy Spirit and the Origins, Christian Origins. James G. Dunn, it's a great book. It's about 400 pages, but different essays from different people. So let's go to the second point of motivation to live righteously. So a motivation to live righteously. So we talked about living in expectancy for what's to come, knowing that God can come at any given moment. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11, but the end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as, God, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles, or in other uh, manuscripts, as the utterances of God, If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we're going to unpack these verses um, because it's very important. And if you love prophecy, this should be your attitude. You should model this because Peter is talking to us. If you love prophecy and don't have this attitude, you need to please study these verses um, I, I, I see this way too often in people's perspectives. That's why I'm telling you this. So 1 Peter 4, 7, but in the end of all things, the end of time it's referring to is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. So, okay, well, there's two descriptions that we have to be in our prayers because this is the end times. And again, with the fact that we are even closer to the end now than yesterday or when Peter was writing this, even more so we should be this way. So Peter's telling us that regarding the end times, we need to be serious and watchful. So the serious is, the Greek word is sophro neo. Um, what that means is to be sensible or to be reasonable. And it's a verb and it's active and it's in the imperative form. What does that mean? It's, it's an action, it's continual, and it's a commandment, okay? To think and to live wisely in self-control over one's passions and one's desires. Um, and our emotions, that, go, that falls into our emotions as well. One of the things I've always said, one of the things that being in the world and being, in, being a Christian, a born-again believer, one thing is true on either both sides. Emotions that get you killed. It will. Because emotions will sway you Your emotions will go back and forth, will go to and fro, but the word of God will endure forever and it'll be the same yesterday, today, and forever for more. And I love that about God. So we can't be going to and fro, especially when it comes to emotions. So another word is the watchful. Watchful, this word is nepho, it doesn't matter about the name, but I want you to understand the definition of it. To curb the controlling influence of inordinate emotions or desires and therefore become reasonable. Reasonable. Why? Because when it comes to the end times, there's so many unreasonable people. That's the reality, that's why. There's so much unreason. It just doesn't make sense. So, and, and this scenario, this is the same thing when I know uh, a U-turn has heard this, to be sober-minded. This is the same word. And it, 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 there, there's, it's so much more 
then it doesn't mean sobriety, although it does. It's so much more than being sober, being sober. Because I'll tell you this, you can be sober in sobriety in, in that aspect, but you're still not sober. Does that make sense? You still won't be sober. You can still have a filthy attitude. You can still have an arrogant pride. For, and listen, we all go through that. Every single one of us, everyone in here, I don't care if you say you don't, where if you don't say it, you're lying for being honest. So we need to be that in our prayers. We need to be reasonable. We need to be watchful. We need to be serious about what we're doing in our prayers. The question is to to each and every one of us is, uh, uh, you know, let alone these things and these words and descriptions, are we even praying to the ability that God has given us through the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit knows what to pray for. He already knows. Sometimes you just sit there. And he'll bring, uh, it was really awesome not that long ago. Um, one of the cool things that God still ge- allows me, then, which I do, I just pray. When I take out blood, that's what I do. I, I just pray. And it was very, very, I mean, I just, things just kept coming to me. You guys, um, individually, collectively, things for the church, and just in general. It was just awesome. He just kept giving me things to pray about. It was so wonderful. And I was just sitting there. Um, just asking God to, to be, you know, to be there and to, for me to listen. You know, we, we need to be um, having those ears, being slow to speak, slow to anger, all these things, all, these, all these, uh, these attributes, these characteristics come only from the Lord. And so we need to be, we need to be reasonable, sensitive. But again, this is both of these words, it's in the imperative form. It's a commandment. We need to do these things. So, I want you to notice something. The translators, even the translators, when they translated these two words, even though it's similar to other things that I've just explained about being sober, because of the context, they, they did that. There's, there's a slight difference in the word. It changes the context of it. So, in James 5, 8 through 9, it says, you also be patient Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Who's the judge? We've, we've talked about this. Who's the, who's the only judge here? Judge is, God is the one that judges. God is the one that, that, that has, and that's why vengeance is his, right? And he says in Revelation 3.20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Behold, Jesus stands at the door and the question is, are you going to let him in? And this is a continual process. You're like, no, I I gave my life to the Lord 50 years ago, Pastor George. I've been there, done that. Well, no, well, you're misunderstanding scripture. And we're going to see how you are misunderstanding scripture if that's what you think it is. It's a, yes, it's a one given moment. It's one, you give your life to the Lord. But if you want to live an impactful life for the Lord, you will pay attention for the rest, rest of this, this sermon. And just listen. So that, let's continue. Next verses. Don't do, in other words, don't let another day go by if this is what you're thinking. You don't have, if you don't have that assurance in your salvation of the Lord. So let's continue in the next verse. It says, 1 Peter 4, 8 through 9, it says, And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. We've been noticing that theme here, right? So we talked about being serious and being watchful in our prayers, even even though the others were commandments for us, right? As, as we continue reading 1 Peter, because we're going we're gonna to kind of look, continue looking at this all the way to verse 11, if I'm not mistaken. But the other ones were commandments, but there's a sense of more importance when we read this verse, when Peter is talking to us. 
when it comes to the next things Peter's about to talk about. And he says, Being, have, be, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And this is very important because that fervent, in the Greek, it means eager, it means constant, it means, so there, in other words, there needs to be a persistent effort in loving one another. I gotta tell you, some of y'all, I need to be a little more persistent to love, <laughs> if, if I'm being honest, you know? But I'm just joking, you guys are all lovable. But, but yeah, I mean, so it's, it's difficult. It's difficult sometimes. You know, it's easy, it's easy to love someone when, you know, all they do is praise you, right? But what about when you have an altercation? What if you have a discussion? What if you have, what if you have um, some sort of dissension or argument, right? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? Um, that word love is the agape love, right? The, the love that God, the unconditional love that God gives to each and every one of us that unconditional love, because when we love the way God loves, we're going to forgive our brethren's trespasses. Now, sometimes, as I've spoken, is that sometimes you've got to forgive them multiple times, right? Because sometimes, maybe the very next day, he or she does something very, very similar, and guess what? you got to forgive that person right then and there again, and again, and again. That's why Jesus says, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times, 70 times, 70, it, it was a figure of speech. Sometimes you have, to fig, you have to forgive them multiple times in order to truly forgive them. And I know all of us in here, it, we've probably been in that scenario or situation. So, and here's the thing, we gotta do it in a way where there's no grumbling. There's no grumbling, a, a lot of us fail right there if we're being honest. I mean, we've all failed. I know I've failed. It's like, man, that person, I, I'll be honest. I'm like, that, man, that dude or guy or whatever did me dirty. Like, how can I, man, you got to forgive him. You got to forgive him. You have to forgive him without grumbling. Because the minute you start grumbling, what you're saying, what you're truly saying is that, well, their sin is far worse than mine, right? Oh, then you put yourself in a pickle right there, though. You're done, you know? So Proverbs 10, 12 says, hatred stirs up strife, but love, again, covers all those sins. See, if we truly love in a way God wants us to love, we're gonna, look, we're gonna truly look past all those things. We're gonna truly look, up, look past all those shortcomings. And, and let me tell you something, your relationships with people are going to skyrocket. As, as, as Proverbs says, um, uh, to, be, to have friends, therefore you must be friendly, right? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 that's what it is. So when people deserve to be chewed out or disciplined or whatever, and you choose grace to cover their sins, like, you know what? I'm just, I'm gonna choose grace. Um, as opposed to what your flesh wants to do, Right? Um, it's easy to be angry and to rip people's heads off. It's easy. That's easy. It's nothing. It's natural to you and I. It is. It's natural. It doesn't end up being fruitful for you or for them. So 1 Peter, continuing in the verses, um, finish off here. It says, 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11, it says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. That in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. So here's the thing, amen. And, and we all have a gift, every single one of us here and listening online, we all have a gift. If you don't know what your gift is, uh, there's, there's so much that you can do to be involved to figure out what truly your gift is. And those gifts sometimes shift in seasons as well. God um, I know for me, there was um, gifts that God had to, 
work out and provide for me in order for me to become a pastor, right? And, and I see that throughout my life. And I see that, especially with the love of people. That's one of the biggest things in my life. You know, I loved people, but it wasn't, it isn't what it is now, right? And I mean, and if you become a pastor, you better love people, right? So, but it was something that God had to give me in order for me to, to really be good and really fulfill what God has called me to do. So, but we all have one. Some of you may have two, some of you may have three, um, but without a shadow of a doubt, you do have at least one. But here's the thing, let him do it as with the ability which who supplies? God supplies. So God is the one, we've been talking about, God is the one that supplies these gifts. And the question you wanna ask yourself is why? So that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Why? So that no man should boast on his gift and everything should be back to him. This is important. If you're doing it for yourself, you're, you're, you're doing it off the wrong motive and you will get burnt out and you won't, you won't fulfill it. You really won't. So let's, let's, look, let's look back at the text where God supplies. Like I said, looking at, oh, I'm sorry, I already went over that, forgive me. <laughs> but one of the things that it reminds me of is of the parable in Matthew chapter 25. It says, for the kingdom of heaven, and in this sense, it's not referring to literal heaven that what we've been talking about. This is referring to the church or church age. Is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to the one, to, and to the one he gave five talents, another two and another one to each according to his own ability. And see, here's the thing. Um, those talents, just a little reference, those talents were not talents as you and I, oh, you have this talent and you can sing. Or, no, 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 this was money. One talent was equal to 75 pounds in the Greek, um, and it was worth, uh, I can't think off the top of my head, but multiple years, multiple years of salary, just one. I think 20, uh, 20. 20 years, one talent was the equivalent of 20 years of salary. So each one was given different amount. Why? Pay attention to each according to his own ability. He didn't give things to his servants that they weren't able to do, right? Now this is a parable and I'm strong, and I'm, I strongly suggest that when we study parables, um, we don't get much doctrine from it, but this doctrine that I'm teaching you now comes from 1 John. That's why it reminded me of this. Um, but each of these, this, 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 this man gave his servants different things. He didn't give one more than what that person could handle because he knew them, right? He knew them as God knows you and knows the ability that he's instilled in you. So in other words, in, so knowing that the time is coming to a close, because without a shadow of a doubt, like I said, we've, we're closer than any other church age. How much more so should we be utilizing our gifts? And you know what sucks about it? Is that statistically speaking in churches, 10% of the church does 100% of the work. Most of us, come in and sit at the pews and you know even people that come Wednesdays and Sundays faithfully all they do is sit there they hear the word they go home and they do nothing other than that that's the sad part but though that's a fact that's a fact especially when it comes to 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 the to the church in the US the harvest is plenty but the laborers are few i don't know how many went with Brian um, Veach, Pastor Brian, uh, for the homeless outreach, but I guarantee you it wasn't a lot. You know, I, I, I guarantee you it wasn't a lot. Probably a handful of people out of a church that's 200 plus. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm, just, I'm stating that's a fact. I'm not trying to make the church feel bad. 
First John 3, 1 through 3, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Let me ask you a question. What is John referring to right here? This is after he's seen Jesus. This is after he had seen this. So through logic, what is he talking about? He's, he's referring to the appearance of Christ. So John speaks, when he's speaking about this, it's pertaining to the future rapture. We will be made completely like him, right? So then we should live this life with his help to serve him faithfully now and leave and lead the lives of purity that we should be. We should take advantage of every single moment that we have, every opportunity that we have to live for the Lord with gusto, with, with, with oomph, you know what I mean? Like there's nothing, I've told you guys many times, what, I don't wanna live this life in a way where I'm not going all for the Lord because what's the point? Everything else is gonna pass away but our heavenly deeds are not. They're going to be internal and they're gonna have weight to them. We should use our time wisely because you don't know when it's gonna be your last. Listen, you don't wake up one day and be like, yeah, well, today I'm gonna die. No, unless, you know, I'm not referring to a suicide scenario, but you don't choose the day you're going to die. I mean, we could, I mean, I, I live close, right? I'm just kidding, I have a long commute, but. <laughs> no, I live right here, but let me tell you something. There's been a couple times when people hit that corner, they fly right through it. And if you, I live right here in the corner, and they fly right through it. I mean, just fly. And my, the little car that I drive is um, it's just really small, and I know that thing's gonna get toast. Um, <laughs> but there's a couple times where it's like, whoa, like if I'm not paying attention, and I'm talking milliseconds. I, I look, I, I'm looking, looking, and then I pull out, and then look again, boom, the car's already coming. My point is, is that it can happen and occur at any given moment. We do not know when that's going to occur. My cousin, for example, he was 56, 55, 56 years old. I know some younger kids will think that's old, but that's not old. It's not old at all. Now he's, and now he's either in heaven or hell. I don't know him personally on a personal level, but that's the reality of it. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, see that you walk circumspectly, meaning with, <laughs> for lack of a better term, with oomph, with, 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 with a desire to please the Lord, right? With vigilant, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is very, very important and near and dear to me, personally. Especially when, when, I, um, when I have to take out blood, I'm constantly reminded of the frailty of my, my body, you know? Um, that, you know, I, I can go at any given moment, here's the reality, I can die of, an, of a heart attack or a stroke at any given moment because of my condition, right? So it's, it's, it's made me understand. It's like, man, I really need to be about my father's business as when Jesus was in the temple and, and Mary came to him. What are you doing? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? Luke 2, 4, 9. How much, we need to be that way. Psalm 39, 4, it says, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Listen, you, you, you don't got a lot of time, so stop wasting it. Stop wasting it. And I'm not saying we or you or anyone specifically, but if this applies to you, stop wasting it. Let's take a look in Daniel in this regard when he, asked, when he was asked to defile himself. Listen to, these, listen to this word. Daniel 1.8, it says, but Daniel purposed in his heart 
that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He purposed in his heart. That word literally means to fix conclusively or, or authoritatively. He's like, uh-uh, I'm drawing the line right here. Because what the Bible doesn't tell you, and you have to look deeper into this, their names were changed, right? Their names before glorified Jehovah, glorified God. But when they were changed, we don't know the, the, the true definition of, of some of these things, but what we do know is that those names glorified the deity, pagan God that they loved. That's why they called them uh, different names. So he laid down and set that boundary right then and there. You know, there were certain things with, like, with the names. I thought he would have done it with the name, but he didn't. He, he just let it go, right? And I'm sure he let a lot of things go. But when it came to that, he's like, uh-uh, no, that's it right then and there. Because remember, when they took Daniel, he was young, but he was still raised up in the faith. He was probably most likely a teenager, anywhere from 15 to probably 18 or so, because remember, Pharaoh wanted to take the young ones, the ones that were smart, the ones that looked good. And by the way, the way they looked good back then were big, fat, pudgy, bald Men, <laughs> that's, what, <laughs> that's what it was. Like, its culture is different. Many different other, uh, other places besides America, to be big is actually looked upon as, whoa, that's awesome, you're, you're attractive. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm leaving the country, and uh, <laughs> that's, that's my departing, so. But no, seriously, the, the culture the culture's different. There's this story I'll share with you guys. This is totally off star. So there's this story where this pastor, this African pastor, he was, he, um, I read this in the book and they were talking about culture, right? And the guy, the guy's talking to the American pastor. He's like, yeah, yeah, I love my wife. I miss her so much. She's so fat. And the guy looked at him, he's like, what are you talking about? No, 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 that's a good thing. You Americans, you know, you guys like them skinny. No, we like them fat. And it's like, dude, like it just, it just shows you the difference and in, in, in the appreciation. And, and it's just like, wow, it's just culture context is very, very important. And the reason I bring that up too is because I read that in, I was reading it recently um, how we're going to apply context and illusions when we read Revelation. So there's a lot of, a lot of fun, neat stuff that we're going to be going over, and I'm super excited um, for it. So like I said, going back to Daniel, he laid down that boundary. As often we should, we should be laying down boundaries. There's nothing wrong with laying down boundaries. And listen, I love you guys, but if I didn't lay, lay down boundaries, I would be, I would be working 24-7. That's a fact. I would. Again, I love you guys, but that's what I would. I would be on call all day, every night, every, just 100% all the time. But we have to set boundaries. Even Jesus set boundaries. He truly did. He prioritized time with his father. He prioritized sleep. I mean, he was sleeping on a boat when the, when the whole ocean was going crazy or the lake. I mean, that's how much he prioritized sleep. You know, there's, there's a lot of things with our Lord that we can, we can glean from. But anyways, so obviously with the intention, drawing those boundaries, but obviously we, we can't forget the intention of glorifying God. That has to be the, the preface. That has to be before so when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to these things and drawing boundaries, these spiritual things, we can't do without the spirit in love. We truly can't. We have to do it in love. The obedience that Daniel consistently maintained, right? For instance, in, in, in chapter six, Daniel chapter six, for King Darius, he was, he, he, they, they, they did a creed, right? And then he broke that creed and then he ended up being thrown in the lion's den and God closed the mouths of the lions. We all know the story, right? But God blessed that obedience to, to, um, with Daniel. 
One of the things that before we, we go on, I know we've studied and I've been dogmatic. I, I've been in certain things. It's like, no, this is, this is the way it is. But we have to maintain Christian unity, right? Um, even though Christians love to debate many of the points that we've talked about when it comes to f- the Bible prophecy, but one of the things we agree on is on the big stuff. So that's what we need to focus on. We don't want to, I'm not saying not debate, but here's the, here's the thing. Christ is coming again. We all agree on that. Christ will receive incredible body, uh, um, Christians will, be, will receive incredible body upgrades, resurrection, resurrection bodies. Christians will be held accountable at a future judgment for how they lived on earth. Christians will live, to, will live forever with God face to face. One day there will be no more sin, suffering, Satan, or death. We can all agree on all those things. So focus on this. And again, I, I, not saying debate. Absolutely. The Bible tells us to, to debate. What, what was he talking about when he talked to Isaiah? He says, come, let us reason together. That word reason literally means to debate. So debate, yes. Divide, no. That's a difference. One thing I always say without debate error abounds. Without debate, error abounds. So we're going to stop right there. I'm going to ask the the worship team to come on up. But um, again, debate, yes. Divide, no. That's one of the most important things. You know, if they have um, doctrine of the cross, they believe in the cross, they believe Jesus died for our sins and, and rose again in the resurrection, um, and uh, that, that, that all these things that we just spoke about, um, we're, we're going, we, we agree on all those things, it's wonderful, it's great. So let's maintain that unity. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you again for your word, Father. We thank you, Lord, for just who you are, Jesus. We thank you for coming down and tabernacling with us, Father, and and dwelling among us, Father, so that we may have eternal life and we may have a relationship with you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for that, Lord. And I just pray, Father, for just all of us, Lord. We lift up Israel, Lord, and just to what is going on and occurring, Father, out there, Lord. And Lord, we know, Lord, that that Turkey was going to come in because your word says that they are, Lord. They're going to go against Israel, Lord. And we don't know what that entails with their president saying um, that they're going to intervene. Um, The guy was ambiguous, but we do know that your word says that it will occur, Father. So we pray for the protection of Jerusalem, Lord. We pray for the protection of your people, Father. We pray for salvation, Lord. We pray for all the families, Lord, with the little kids and the youth that were, I think, I believe it was 12, Lord, that lost their lives, Father. We pray for their families, Lord. We lift them all up, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you use this for your glory. We use it in a, that you use it in a way that you bring these families to salvation, Father. Lord, it's so hard and so difficult, Lord, that when we don't know what you have in store for these things, Father, but we know that you are in control and you are on the throne, Father. Lord, we lift all these things up to you, Lord. We lift up the rest of the night for each and every one of us. Pray for traveling mercies, Father, for all of us heading home. Lord, I, I lift up this last song, Lord, that it be a, just a sweet sound to you, Father. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
for coming and listening to God's word. Have a great week, and God bless you. Go with God. Amen.